Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we got a lot to talk about today, including even more class changes coming up, the Dark Moon Fair and how you could take advantage of it, some great gold making opportunities, and so much more. My name is Sky from the Comeback Kids. This is your season of Discovery News. Sit down, grab a cup of coffee. We got a lot to discuss. Okay, now the Dark Moon Fair is officially back in town, and that means a lot of opportunities for you to get some great rewards and make some coin as well. Some of these rewards include a 14 slot bag or even some very powerful epic items for the later phases of Season of Discovery. So if you want to start preparing for that, you could do so as well. Now, if you are blacksmithing, engineering, or leatherworking, there are some additional quests inside of the fair you can turn in that could give you a nice chunk of reputation as well as Dark Moon Fair prize tickets. So the smart thing to do would be to see the required materials for the said quest and put these materials on the auction house as soon as possible as people are definitely going to buy them to instantly gain the reputation as well as tickets. This includes some coarse weight stones, grinding stones, copper modulators, basic leather armor, and a variety of animal parts. You can see all of them on screen here, so definitely take a screenshot or look it up if you need to, to try and take advantage of this market. Not only that, for you sweat lords out there looking to deal as much damage as you possibly can, when the Dark Moon Fair comes around, you can get the Sage's Dark Fortune of Damage buff, which increases your damage by a flat 10%. All you do is speak to the Knoll Sage inside of the fair and select the top most responses multiple times and you will receive this 2 hour buff that could really swing the damage meters in your favor if you have it. I know the Dark Moon Fair may seem like a meme and a bit of a troll to most people in World of Warcraft, but these are some really nice rewards that you guys should definitely take advantage of, so get out there, enjoy the fair, have some fun. Moving on now to the hot topic of today's video, it looks like there are some class changes that are being made right now as we speak. That's right, because Blizzard officially announced that they're making slight changes to the Mage, Paladin, Shaman, and Rogue classes. Starting off with the Mage, it looks like their Living Flame ability is now going to benefit from Arcane Blast stacks. This might lead to some interesting builds coming into play also. If you didn't know, the more you cast Arcane Blast, the more stacks you gain in increasing damage of the next Arcane spell by 15% as well as the mana cost significantly. So stacking this up to four times, you can see an increase in Living Flame's damage if properly rotated by up to 60%. It's important to know that Living Flame was already one of their best AoE DPS abilities, so it consuming arcane charges can definitely spice things up in terms of build variety, so we're going to have to see how this turns out. We also have changes to the Paladin class, which now the Avenger Shield movement slow is now properly considered a snare, and it can be removed by effects that remove movement impairing effects. Now, if you verse the Paladin in PvP or duels in general, you know that Avenger Shield was an incredibly strong rune because it is a ranged 10 second daze that you could not get out of. So it seems like Blizzard took notice of the crazy potential of this ability and tuned it to where you could at least remove the slow if you have the opportunity to do so. Not only that, the mana generated by Seal of the Martyr to party and raid members has also been increased as well. It now grants the party and raid members 20% of the damage the Paladin takes from the Seal, rather than it being 10%. Now, the mana regen from this spell isn't amazing by all means, but doubling the amount of mana from before should make it a lot better for protection paladins. I don't see you ever swapping Divine Storm for this seal because Divine Storm is just simply way too strong and it does way too much damage on such a short cooldown, but maybe it can perform a lot better now and bring some variety in builds in terms of having even more utility for your raid group. We're gonna have to see. So now moving on to Rogue, their Blade Dance tanking rune has been updated to now grant 10% parry chance at all combo point ranks rather than increasing the parry chance the more combo points you spend on the ability. The only effect of more combo points as of now is to simply increase the duration. Previously, the only way to get 10% increased parry chance was that you had to use Blade Dance at a very costly 5 combo points. Most of the time, you would never even be able to reach that because mobs would die so quickly that your combo points would just dissipate and go away. So rogues now having the opportunity to gain the maximum damage mitigation for the lowest amount of combo points is a great buff that the class desperately needs because everyone knows that rogue tanking is kind of lacking right now. Moving on now lastly to shaman, they're seeing a very similar buff from their distant cousin the paladin with their mana granted by shamanistic rage to party and raid members being increased 
granting them 20% of the mana gain from the ability rather than it being the previous 10%. This is definitely a massive buff for Shaman, as this ability is on a very minor 1 minute cooldown, and can grant the Shaman upwards of close to 100 mana per second if you use it properly with raid buffs. So giving your party and raid members roughly 20 mana a second for 15 seconds on a short 1 minute cooldown is something that is going to be fantastic in terms of utility for your raid, on top of having your totems and solid DPS. So Shaman should definitely be happy about that one. They also made an interesting addition to tailoring as a profession, with now you having the ability to craft the Invoker's Cord and the Invoker's Mantle. They state that both of these grant additional spell damage and healing, and these recipes can be purchased inside of Orgrimmar or Dionysus near the tailoring trainers. Now currently at the time of making this video, I've been trying to see what these recipes are and they aren't currently on Wowhead or in the game, but you can expect them to be pretty solid if they grant additional spell damage and healing at level 25. So heads up when it comes to jumping on a really nice gold making opportunity for you tailors out there. The Blizzard team also announced that an additional update is underway and will be added to the game later this week. So we will keep you updated on that when the time comes also. Speaking of additional gold making opportunities, it seems like it's becoming harder and harder to make gold inside of Season of Discovery, with everything becoming so saturated and bots farming just about everything out there in the world of Azeroth. We just wanted to give you a heads up on some really great materials or tips on making gold as of price checking everything right now today on our server. Of course, you have the very consistent iridescent pearl farm that drops from clams on higher level murlocs as well as naga enemies that go for nearly two gold a pop. We have Grave Moss that goes for roughly 20 silver a pop, which is used to make Shadow Protection Potions for BFD, amongst other alchemy recipes. We have the Free Action Potions that just completely shot up in price because it has just been discovered that it can be used on the Kelris boss fight in BFD to make the fight significantly easier during the second phase. So items like Black Mouth Oil have nearly doubled in price over the last couple days also. And the key ingredient for making the Black Mouth Oil is coming from fish. And speaking of fish, a fantastic channel that gives you a ton of different ways to make a wide variety of gold on fishing is actually from Kago Gaming, where you can fish up a wide variety of wreckage out in the world to get a ton of super high level green armor and weapons to sell to the vendor for a high price. You could also get mana potions, which are selling for nearly one gold a pop. So if you're looking for a calm way to make gold, fishing is the way to go. Lastly, we have, of course, the Shredder Turbochargers, which are still used to get a lot of key ingredients on classes for turning in anywhere between 15 to 20 of them at a quest in Ratchet. So that's a very solid way as well. But these are some of the best ways to make gold right now inside of Season of Discovery based on the auction house and what's always going to be in high demand wrapping up this first phase for Season of Discovery. Additionally, we even got more changes to the Battle for Ashenvale event these last couple days. And let me tell you, the Classic team has been very active when it comes to player feedback and what is best for this open world PvP event. Now, both the Alliance and Horde faction leaders are now spawned inside of Ashenvale while the Battle for Ashenvale event is inactive. And the primary reason for this is that you can turn in the quest items before the event actually starts. So the Alliance Leader can be found in Astronar, while the Horde Leader can be found in Splinter Tree Post. Then, when the battle becomes active, they are teleported to their regular battlefield positions. Agren, the senior producer for World of Warcraft Classic, stated that they've gotten a lot of feedback since they made the changes about retiring layers to improve player performance inside of Ashenville. They also made it very clear that when they made this change, that it would make Ashenville feel a bit less populated in certain situations. He stated that they got a lot of feedback since they made that change and they don't want to get into a situation where the fix is worse than the issue they're trying to currently solve. So what they did was that they re-enabled the auto retire layer feature, which means that you can now once again get put onto a new layer suddenly out of nowhere if your current layer starts to shut down. If you all haven't noticed, they made the change last week and while it did improve player performance and streamline the event, it made Ashenville feel a lot more empty. I remember personally running along the roads all down the entirety of the zone and only encountered just a few Alliance players total. In my opinion, it wasn't worth the integrity of the PvP event as it was very key in making the zone feel alive and active, you know, running into the opposing faction constantly. So I saw this as a very much needed and well-deserved change, and they made it happen. Not only that, they also announced that because of these changes, Battle for Ashenville will now progress 50% faster than previously, and that the reputation gain from killing some of the lieutenants in the zone is increased to 400, which was previously 200. 
So they vastly increase the rewards, increase the speed at which the event starts, and increase the activity inside of the zone while also keeping the server stabilization all the same. All very, very big W's from Blizzard and the developers. So don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, if you guys have any ideas or feedback about the game, express yourself as much as you possibly can because they're keeping track of all of our concerns for the betterment of the game. For example, we also saw a forum post asking for flex rating instead of a full 40-man raid roster for Season of Discovery, stating that I would love to see flex rating in Season of Discovery, so maybe we can bring more players just above 10, like maybe 12 or 13, or with a 25-man raid, we could bring 23 or 24. Now, if you don't know, ladies and gentlemen, flex rating means that the enemies inside of a raid have their damage and health adjusted based on how many players you have inside of your raid group. They do this in Retail World of Warcraft, which allows more flexibility in terms of player count and raid composition. I know from personal experience that my guild is struggling a little bit with filling out multiple raid groups each lockout, so we have to constantly pick up pugs and people of the world rather than filling it with nothing but guild members. I personally would love for there to be flex raiding inside of raids for Season of Discovery, and I think it would be a great way to include more players from your guild or maybe even more pugs rather than missing lockouts because you don't even have enough personnel present. Let me know what you guys think about it in the comment section below. Speaking of hearing from you all, our previous news video reached an absolute record shattering 1000 comments in a single video. Just want to quickly say thank you all so much for supporting the algorithm for really trying to get us to become the best season of discovery content creators as we possibly can for all of you guys. So thank you so much for the likes and comments. Starting off with Zachary Short stating that I personally love that the Majestic Shaman is exclusive to the Horde and the Dirty Paladin is exclusive to the Alliance. Huge part of the classic feel to me. I gotta agree with Zachary on this one, man. I think it really fills out the classic World of Warcraft vibe that there are class exclusives on both factions. Now, don't get me wrong. I like my Drenai Shamans and Blood Elf Paladins and Burning Crusade, but there's just something about classic World of Warcraft and Shamans being only Horde dropping those totems and using Wind Fury that just gets me amped up. I think it really helps when it comes to the lore of the game, as well as being more proud to be a part of my faction. I will say, though, that right now, Paladins are much better than Shaman in just about every way. But I promise you that's going to change next phase. So what do you guys think? Do you guys like the class exclusivity? Do you think we should have dwarf shamans and tauren paladins? Let us know in the comment section below. We also have Isatarik stating adding solo battleground cues and dual spec is something that is beyond needed. And to be honest, ladies and gentlemen, I have to agree with this as well. I've been slamming my fist on the desk for solo queue battlegrounds as well as pre-made group queue because... Nothing feels worse right now in Season of Discovery than trying to just casually go into Warsong Gulge and getting stomped by a pre-made full of Hunters, Priests, and Paladins. I also think that dual spec is something that the community is begging for because the rune system encourages multi-specking so much. Don't get me wrong, it's great that they lowered the respec cost, but with all these new runes and abilities, it makes me want to change my spec like every 10 minutes. So please, Blizzard, if you're listening, try to give us dual spec next phase. I promise the community will thank you so much for it. We also have Polaniet's team stating, is the market crashing due to the high supply of bots or because people can't do any more quests to get the reward money? There are quite a few gold sinks if you think about it. It's probably a mix of both. Now, I do know that one of the more straightforward ways of making gold right now is simply just questing out in the world. But to be honest, I'm personally a little scared to do something like that because I don't want to run out of quests to complete next phase when I'm trying to level up to level 40. I'm not the type of player that wants to go sit in a dungeon and spam it until I hit max level because I like being out in the open world. I love interacting with players of the opposing faction as well as seeing new things and questing also. But now that I think of it, there are a great amount of gold sinks in Season of Discovery. I mean, every single raid you have potions that are required. There's farming your Prebis, a mount for 10 gold inside of Asheville, buying all your spells. Not only that, you have to do all this for all your alt characters as well, so... Now that I think about it, there is a lot of gold sinks inside of the first phase, and it could just simply be that players are running low on gold. Lastly, we have Stargazer stating that, you know what I'd love to see? Arena queuing in Season of Discovery, from 1 vs. 1s to 5v5s. Imagine how fun that would be, or that you could queue at a Gurabashi Arena or something like that. 
Now, listen, as a big time PvP -er, I absolutely love this idea. I always really enjoyed in some of the private servers for Classic WoW that you could have a straight up 1v1 queue option for an arena. And it's something that is super laid back and relaxed rather than being so intense and drawn out and long like Battlegrounds. It's not something that needs to be balanced at all, just a fun way to get in there and compete with your character, whether it be 5v5 games or just simply 1v1s. Either way, an arena queue system for me in Season of Discovery is definitely welcome, and I advocate big time for this one. Maybe even some of the rewards can include tabards, titles, or even, you know, things of that nature. Let me know what you guys think. Don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, leave a comment below for me to respond to live here on these news videos to have a little bit of a discussion point and talk about it. I would love to see your opinions on some of the topics in these videos. So if you want your voice to be heard, let me know about it below. If you enjoyed the video, please be sure to like and subscribe to get absolutely flooded with Season of Discovery content. I want to thank you all so much for watching this video. It is an absolute pleasure to be making content for you all. Until the very end, my name is Sky from the Comeback Kids. I will see you all in the next one. Peace.